The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Matt Keeley and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Centre in partnership with the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st Century, or REN21. Today's webinar is focused on the global renewable energy transition, who is leading. Today's webinar presentation provides an overview of analysis and findings presented in REN21's newly released 2019 version of the Renewables Global Status Report with a regional emphasis on Asia. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. Panelists, just a gentle reminder to please mute your mic when not presenting to avoid interference from background noise. If you'd like to ask an ex a question, you may use the questions box where you can may type in your question. If you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you will find a PDF copy on the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training and you can follow along as your speakers present. Also, the audio recording and presentations will be pre posted to the Solutions Centre training page within a few days of the broadcast and will be added to the Solutions Centre YouTube channel where you'll find other informative webinars and video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Finally, one important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Centre does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Centre's resource library as one of many best practice resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Today's webinar is centred on a presentation from our guest panellists. Uh, who has joined us to, to discuss latest data and findings on what is happening in the renewable energy sector. Drawing directly from REN21's REN newly released Renewables 2019 Global Status Report. Kanika will then comment on financing the energy transition with a particular focus on Asia. Before we jump into the presentations, I'll provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Centre. Following the panelists' presentations, we'll have a question and answer session where Vibhu and Kanika will, will address questions submitted by the audience. At the end of the webinar, you'll be automatically prompted to fill out a brief feedback survey, and we thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond to this. The Clean Energy Solutions Centre was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. Created in 2010, the Clean Energy Ministerial is a global forum where major economies and forward-leaning countries work together to share best practices and promote policies and programs that encourage and facilitate the transition to a global clean energy economy. 25 countries and the European Commission are members of the Clean Energy Ministerial and in total, uh, SEM members account for approximately 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions and 90% of global clean energy investments. The Solution Centre provides objective analysis on policy and market mechanism options that, to help governments make informed decisions on policy, regulation and finance mechanism design that support the development of advanced clean energy technologies. This support is accomplished through access to expert assistance and capacity building activities offered through a team of subject matter experts living and working in regions around the, and around the globe. The Solutions Centre is co-led by the governments of Australia and the United States. The Solutions Centre provides several clean energy policy programs and services, including a team of over 60 global experts that can provide remote and in-person technical assistance to governments and government-supported institutions, 
free web-based virtual trainings on a variety of clean energy topics, creating partnerships with development agencies and regional and global organisations to deliver support, an online resource library populated with over 3,500 clean energy policy related publications, tools, videos and other resources. Our primary audience is made up of energy policy makers and analysts from governments and technical organisations in all countries, but we also, also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs and civil society. The Solutions Centre is a global initiative that works with the numerous international and regional partners. Several of the partners are listed above, including REN21. The Solutions Centre ma Centre's marquee feature is the free expert assistance service known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert service matches policy makers with one of the more one of one of the more than sixty global experts selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. If you have a need for policy assistance in renewable energy or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, this assistance is provided free of charge and is designed to help uh, to provide quick responses. If you have a solution for our, if you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. We also invite you to share information about this valuable service to those in your networks and organisations. So now I'd like to provide a brief introdu introduction and welcome to today's panellists, Vibhu Shri Hamir Wasia. Vibhu is the Community Manager at REN21 and we are pleased and honoured to have her present the findings of REN21's newly released 2019 edition of the Renewables Global Status Report. Vibhu, welcome. As I set up Vibhu's slides, I'd just like to quickly uh, remind participants to submit questions through uh, the questions pane at any time throughout Vibhu's presentation. Um, and Vibhu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matt. Renewables are powering the world. 26% of global electricity came from renewable energy in 2008. Renewable energy also uh, accounted for two thirds of the global investment in power generation. In all of this, where does Asia fit? Well, Asia supplies 40% of global energy, but it also contributes to 45% of carbon emissions. Energy consumption continues to grow, and so does demand. However, most of these capacity additions to meet this demand continues to come from fossil fuels. Good morning from Asia, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Thank you for tuning in. I would like to present some key findings from our recently launched Renewables 2019 Global Status Report, with some focus on what's happening in Asia, and then I will pass it over to Kanika, is, uh, who would present some insights and investment in the region. We have the next slide, please. So, who are we? REN21 is an international policy network made up of passionate players, which belong to uh, these key three of uh, these five key stakeholder groups. So, science and academia, international, uh, international organizations, governments, associations, and NGOs. Next, please. What we do is we try and uh, provide evidence, so the most up-to-date evidence on renewable energy and create knowledge to shape the global energy debate in this transition to renewables. One of our flagship publications is the Global Status Report, and this is the 14th year of its publication. This is followed by many other reports on the global scale, including one for cities, which will be up, uh, coming up this year apart from regional reports, thematic reports, etc. But we also use uh, we, we also use this knowledge and evidence to try and create debates. One of one such is the REN21 Academy and another one is the International Renewable Energy Conference. Next please. The Renewables Global Status Report, as I mentioned, this is the 14th year of its uh, of the GSR as we call it. It includes many 
it includes thousands of data points and uses hundreds of documents and personal communications with experts to provide the most up-to-date information available. We look at advances in renewable energy markets, policy frameworks, and industries globally. And this production of the GSR is not something we do solely at Trend 21, but we really build on a, uh, on a multi-stakeholder community of over 1,500 individual experts who actually are the key contributors to this flagship publication. Next, please. So, what's happening in the world of renewable energy? 2018 was another strong year for renewable energy. Total capacity grew 8%, which includes hydropower. But even the growth was even faster when you look at non-hydro capacity. So it grew 15%. By the end of the year, um, hydropower no longer accounted for more than half of installed renewable power capacity was at 48%. Meanwhile, a wind and solar PV continued to, uh, uh, additions in wind and solar PV continued to increase. And for the first time, uh, totaled around 45%. Next slide, please. Investment. Investment in renewable energy, although fell globally, fell 11.5% in 2018, which was mainly driven by a sharp decline in China. And this was a result of policy changes that reduced financial support for solar PV projects in the country. However, developing and emerging economies overtook developed countries in investment for the first time in 2015. And they retained this lead in 2018, although it was by a much smaller amount. Said, please. Investment also declined in India, but rose in, it rose in the rest of Asia. And when I say rest of Asia, that excludes India and China, as they are quite the outliers in, in the Asia Pacific. However, despite this decline, China accounted for a majority of global investment for the seventh consecutive year, which came in at 32%. The next, when, when we look at Asia, Oceania, excluding India and China, that was 15% of global investment, so still very significant. India was somewhat, uh, was somewhat smaller, which was about 5%. So while investment decreased, it, it, Asia, in, uh, including India and China, was still a major part of the global investment. Next, please. But, and, and I think one of the biggest characteristics of this energy transition is renewable power, where renewable power, the power sector has been leading and renewables have been supplying more than 26% of global electricity. This was the case in 2018. For the first time, more electricity was from solar PV than biopower. And there was a strong growth in renewable generation, but with the rising demand in electricity, it makes it harder and much more challenging to achieve larger shares. So renewable power now makes up one third of global capacity. This growth is absolutely amazing as uh, the global composition has continued to shift with uh, uh, hydro, as I mentioned, hydropower is no longer more uh, half of installed capacity and wind and solar have been increasing, which is um, we, when, we, when you look at uh, the composition for the last 10 years, this is quite amazing. Can we go next? So in terms of additions, this, this was 181 gigawatts of renewable power. And around 55% of these new additions were solar PV, followed by wind, hydro, and the rest. So biopower, uh, CSP, and geothermal. 2018 was also the fourth consecutive year where more than 50 gigawatts of wind power was added. Next, please. And this, I think, is the most encouraging slide of all, where we say more renewable power capacity was added compared to fossil fuel and nuclear power. So if you look at, um, if you look at uh, pure installations, this marked nearly two thirds, which is 64% of net, net installations 
from renewable sources of energy. And this marked the fourth consecutive year that net emissions of renewable power were above 15%. Next, please. If we dig down, uh, dig deeper into technology, solar PV capacity additions past the 100 gigawatt mark. Cumulative, this means that the cumulative capacity was 505 gigawatt, an increase of 25% from 2017. Asia was the main world market for solar PV for the sixth consecutive year, led of course by China, followed by India, and then uh, and then several other markets in Asia, including Japan. However, in, uh, in the region's top three markets were very clearly China, India, and Japan. Asia was followed by the Americas, and um, the top five national markets, as you can see, were responsible for about three quarters of newly installed capacity. Please. Now, floating solar PV is actually quite an interesting technology for Asia. It's, it, it's quite new and I mean um, this is something that has been driven by rapid development of, uh, uh, of so, uh, floating solar in China in, um, and in other Asian markets including Japan, Korea, Chinese Taipei and then also the UK. One of the most interesting parts about this is that the first uh, floating uh, PV installation was a 20 kilowatt pilot system, which was uh, in Japan, completed in Japan in 2007. But just over a decade later, floating systems exist in at least 29 countries in nearly every region of the world and are under consideration of development in many more countries. So this is perhaps an interesting development for the region. Next, please. Wind power continues to increase steadily year on year, and it was up 9% in terms of uh, additions. So uh, the cumulative capacity was up 591 gigawatts in 2018. Of, this, uh, of, the, of the additions, there were, this includes both onshore and offshore, with of course the majority being onshore for the moment, but offshore being quite, uh, quite significant as well. Um, it was the fifth year where annual additions exceeded 50 gigawatt, but also was the third year of decline following the peak in 2015. So next. Offshore wind has very, um, very significantly been concentrated in Europe, but it's now sparking interest in other parts of the world as well. So by the end of 2018, there were 17 countries globally which had offshore wind capacity. The UK is a clear leader. However, seven countries in Europe and two in Asia connected uh, about 4.5 gigawatts, increasing global cumulative capacity by 24% last year. Europe is still very much the leader, however, with 79% of global capacity. Biopower continues um, to, to rise, increased 6.5% in 2018. And the electric bioelectricity generation increased 9%, most notably in China. The EU remains the largest generator by region, but other top, but other countries included uh, China, Brazil, Germany, India, and Japan. Hydropower. When we talk about hydropower, there were the market in 2018 looked very similar to the preceding year in terms of capacity and concentration of activity. It added an estimated, uh, estimated 20 gigawatt to reach an install, install capacity of around uh, 1,100 gigawatt. Uh, China was the clear leader with 35% of new installations, but this was followed quite closely by countries in the region such as Pakistan, uh, India, and of course, other Central Asian and uh, other markets. Next. Geothermal is another interesting technology for this region, especially since Indonesia and the Philippines are quite significant in terms of geothermal power capacity. An estimated um, 0.5 gigawatt of new gen uh, geothermal power generating capacity came online last year. This brought the global total to around 13.3 uh, gigawatt, 
Turkey and Indonesia, as you can see by this slide, um, were about two thirds of new capacity. Modern renewables. So this, this, I mean, I think all of these slides show quite clearly that modern renewables are slowly gaining ground in final energy de demand. But as you could see, I mean, we spoke about 26% of um, all of power gen uh, of the power sector came from renewables. But here you can see that the rest, a renewable share, a share of total final energy consumption, is only 10.6%. Now this means that this is total final energy demand, which includes um, uh, which includes all kinds of end use sectors, and this is where we still need to make a lot of energy. So progress in heating, cooling, and transport has been very limited, as we'll see from the next slide. So renewable in heating and cooling are increasing very slowly. Uh, heating and cooling is 51% of total final energy consumption. However, the share of renewables is at around 10%. And this, the demand growth is quite dismal and minimal. Uh, there is a lot of lack, uh, uh, there's a lack of policy support in this sector. And in fact, the number of countries with regulatory policies fell from 21 to 20. The, the one that, um, that, uh, that removed its uh, policy support was Kenya, actually. And only 47 countries had targets for renewable heat and cooling. Bioheat is a majority uh, pro uh, provider of, uh, or a majority component of the renewable energy in the heating sector, but integration with the power sector is key. <laughs> the growth rate has slowed for solar water heating uh, capacity addition. Cumulative global operating capacity is 2% only. A majority of this is glazed collectors. And the uh, 2018 increase is the smallest in the last 10 years. Moving on to the transport sector. Again, there's a lot of talk, especially in Asia and, um, and other regions of the world about electric vehicles and electric mobility. And so biofuels and EVs are growing, but the renewable share in transport remains really low. And transport is 32% of total final energy consumption, whereas renewable energy in that is 33.3%. So extremely small. Transport also accounts for uh, around a quarter of global CO2 emissions. And while the renewable share grew a little bit, it's not enough. Biofuels make up the majority of this contribution, but the sector is increasingly open to electrification as we see with trends in transport. However, if you go to the next slide, we'll see that um, the, and, and, the, and you can see in the next slide that the electric passenger vehicle stock grew over 60%. So the electric mobility revolution is here and it's happening and we all talk about, hear about it and talk about it about it. So we have about 5.1 million electric cars on the road and 260 million electric two-wheelers and three-wheelers, which is particularly interesting for this region. Um, electric cars, however, you know, despite this growth, is still a small share of all passenger vehicles at just over 2.1% at year's end. EVs also, EV markets are also highly concentrated. 40% of all EVs were clustered in just 20 cities that are together account for 3% of the global population. China, of course, is the leader of the global EV stock in 2018, and it was followed by the United States. So what does all of this electric uh, mobility revolution mean? If you go to the, the next slide, please, Matt. You can see that there's very little direct linking of EVs and renewables. EVs, of course, can play a role in increasing uh, renewables in transport when powered by renewable electricity. And that is a very important point to keep in mind while we're all working in this uh, transition. There was only one country with policy support directly linking renewables to EVs, whereas around 49 countries have independent targets of each other of renewable electricity and EVs. So they are not exactly linked, and while there is this um, revolution, it's it's not 
it's a, uh, the, the linkage to renewable energy is quite minimal or negligible even. So if we put whatever we've seen so far together, we see that we have to go beyond power. Or 80% of total final electricity consumption and demand comes from heating, cooling, and transport. Power is a mere 17% of this equation, and of which we are doing really good, making really good progress with 26% of renewable energy. However, heating, cooling, and transport is where we need to speed up the transition. Now, when we look at, um, and, and then when we look at um, global transport energy needs, where else do they come from if not renewable energy? These are met by oil and petroleum products and 0.8% um, of non-renewable energy. So why is the, why are advances in the power sector happening so fast? Next slide, please. A lot of the advances have been made pol uh, possible by policy support. As you can see, 135 countries had power regulatory policies as opposed to 20 countries for heating and cooling. Transport was somewhere in between with around 70 countries, but um, the disparity is really large. The number of countries with heating and cooling regulatory policies fell from 21 to 20, as you might remember from, my, from one of my earlier slides. Um, there were no new, uh, outside the power sector, renewables have, policies for renewables have advanced at a really slow pace. There were no additional countries for, uh, that adopted biofuel mandates and no new countries that added regulatory incentives or mandates for renewable heating and cooling. Um, carbon pricing policies are among the mechan policy mechanisms that can stimulate interest in low carbon and renewable energy technologies. But by the end of 2018, this, these covered only 44 countries. If we move on to the next slide. This means that targets are certainly uneven across sectors. Targets in the power sector, as you'll see from the bottom part of the slide, the bottom graphic, are far more ambitious and, uh, and, and far more um, and, and will be achieved or, or have targets which are for far less time, to be achieved in far less time. Whereas targets for renewable uh, heating, cooling, and transport are not only less numerous, but also far less ambition, ambitious. And this trend has continued despite the much greater contribution of these sectors to total final energy consumption. The 100% renewable energy movement has continued to gain traction in the power sector, but major, especially in the power sector. Whereas Denmark is the only country with a target for 100% renewables in total final energy. So it's one country in all of the world. Next one, please. As I mentioned, carbon pricing uh, exists in some countries. There are at least 54 carbon pricing initiatives uh, implemented by in 2018. Um, 27 of these were emission trading systems and 27 were carbon taxes. They cover 44 countries, but and they will also cover only 13% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Next, please. So why is, why is this a concern? One of the biggest issues is that renewables don't operate on a level playing field with uh, fossil fuels and nuclear. Fossil fuel subsidies, as you can see by this slide, are still extremely widespread. Global subsidies reached an estimated uh, $300 billion in 2017, which increased from the year before. And this was about double the estimated support for renewable power generation. Fossil fuel subsidies have remained in place in at least 115 countries in 2017, and 73 countries provide subsidies of more than hundred million dollars each. Next please. So we strongly believe that the sustainable energy future requires stronger policy action, but now, because we are not on track to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees and to achieve SDG 7 goals for renewables efficiency and energy access. 
And these climate and developmental challenges call for accelerating the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Moving on. During, if you look at this slide, it tells you which countries led the way in 2018. And I think for me personally, the second line, which says investment in renewable power, because in the first one, you have a lot of the large economies, whereas in the second uh, row, you have Palau, Djibouti, Morocco, Iceland, Serbia, countries that normally don't show up. And these are these show a con very clearly the disproportionate rate at which smaller and developing countries invest in renewable energy. <clears throat> yes, please. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, you'll see that the renewable energy leaders at the end of 2018, and I've marked the ones which are more relevant to Asia. Um, of course, China and India are on many of these uh, on many of these lists, but um, you'll see geothermal has uh, geothermal has quite uh, has 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 a lot of other Southeast Asian countries. Solar PV has invested in Japan, India, and China, and renewable power capacity. With we exclude hydropower is also um, quite interesting. China and Japan. Next, please. It's important to consider that jobs uh, increased in 2018. The renewable energy sector uh, employed around 11 million people worldwide, with solar PV being the largest employer. And the largest employer in the region was, of course, China. Uh, followed very closely by India. Next, please. So where is Asia leading? It's the largest regional wind power market. It has an increasingly number, increasing number of people employed in off-grid solar and biofuels. And excluding India and China, it accounted for 15% of total renewable investment. It increased um, 6%, the highest in two years, uh, in three years. And it has the largest percentage increase in R&D. But another very interesting point in, uh, from, uh, from 2007 to 2018 was that 91% of the population in Asia now has access to this. Next, please. Asia is also leading the global decrease in primary energy intensity. Power. Uh, this was characterized by um, and by more efficient manufacturing facilities and um, and also the share of energy intensive industry and commerce has continued to shrink relative to all other econ economic economic next please and energy demand in non oecd countries which includes a lot of asian countries continues to rise and this is particularly relevant for asia because Energy demand is growing at a very rapid pace in the in the in the region, but a lot of this energy demand is met by fossil fuels and nuclear. With the majority of coal-fired and new nuclear power plants are uh, being located in the region. In addition, 200 gigawatt of coal-fired power plants have already been commissioned in Asia and the Pacific. So this really shows a disconnect between energy demand and what it's being supplied by. Next, please. Global household electric city consumption also increases with uh, the most rapid increase in Asia with an average annual growth of 2.7%. please. And as I mentioned, access to energy has expanded. So if you look at the graph, the second, um, the second box on uh, or the box in the middle up top is about talks about all developing and emerging Asian countries, and you can see that in the last uh, in the last ten years, eight nine years or so, electricity access increased quite substantially, and so did access to clean cooking. India was one of the uh, in, India was one of the countries where the situation changed quite drastically but all of this act, uh, electricity access does not mean that um, that it's 
all of the electricity provided in the library. Next, please. Off-grid solar PV is increasing. Now, 150 million people across Africa and Asia benefit from off-grid solar. 5% um, of this population is in Africa, whereas 2% is in Asia. And a lot of the, actually, um, if you go back to the previous slide, many of these off-grid solar systems provided electricity access to about 9% of the population in Bangladesh. Next, please. Looking at the off-grid solar systems, there has been a 50% annual growth rate between 2010 and 18. Um, also, the dynamics of the market have changed quite quite a bit. So, pico solar sales have decreased. Large solar home systems have increased. Next, please. <clears throat> when we look at cooking, production of biogas has expanded in new markets. 1.125 million people are using. This is rather uh, case. However, um, the use of many other industries in Bangladesh So it's safe to say renewable energy is powering the world. You can see that increasing demand has to be met by long-term planning and supporting policies, which, is, which has actually been one of the main drivers in the power sector and technology and market development. I'm gonna leave this on for about two, three seconds so you can take a look. Um, and you can see that the power sector has, has created a really good system for, um, for, uh, for increasing renewable energy uptake. And it's reliable and mainstream and here to stay. Like this. But what we really need in order to achieve the climate and development goals is moving from an electricity transition to a system transition transformation. Because I put this um, graph again, which shows you that heating, cooling, transport actually consume the most energy in the entire energy system. Power is a much smaller portion, and many people continue to confuse electricity for energy, uh, but renewable energy uh, or the energy system requires a much greater transformation in the electricity sector. And how can this be done? We need to create a level playing field by removing fossil fuel subsidies, as we noticed, and adopting more carbon pricing. We need to encourage more sector integration amongst all of these end use sectors and align policies across national, subnational, and local levels. But it's also important to link to energy efficiency in these policy uh, initiatives. Next, please. The transition is possible, and we have very good examples from the power sector which show how um, this can take place and how best practices and case studies from the power sector can be applied to the other end use sectors. Leadership from national governments is paving the way towards 100% renewables in countries. And cities and subnational governments are actually setting more ambitious policies than their national governments. And as I mentioned right up top, um, the new or the upcoming Renewables in Cities Global Status Report will tell you much more about that. So watch out for that towards the end of the year. Over a thousand organizations, and this talks about the private sector's contribution to renewable energy. Um, a, a, a thousand plus organizations um, have committed that divesting from fossil fuels, and the private sector has doubled its investment in sourcing renewable power. So, if you look at pure examples, Ireland became the first company to commit to divesting its public so, uh, sovereign development from uh, uh, to divesting its public sovereign development fund from coal, oil, and natural gas. And um, Costa Rica, which Energy generates nearly 100% of its electricity sources, announced its plan to transfer subsidies and become the world's first decarbonized So you can see there are several examples, but we, in order to achieve this transformation, achieve the energy transition, we need to have a level playing field and support. 
please. So what's needed to advance this energy transition? As you've seen, renewable power is leading the way. And, you know, we, and the, it shows really good examples and case studies, which we can bring to other end use sectors like cooling and transport. We need to set more ambitious targets globally across regions, countries, and sectors accelerate investment in renewable power. So that does not mean that we stop making advancements in renewable power, but we need to keep in mind that establishing new policy or strengthening existing policy is required for transport. We need to encourage or sector integration needs to happen between the other uh, the new sectors and policies need to be aligned between regional, national and international. We have to support cities in their actions as well and, enact, uh, and, and support local job creation and a just transition. So um, that brings me to nearly the end of my presentation. As you can see, it, the situation in renewable energy has definitely changed in the past 10 years. So but a lot still needs to happen and a lot needs to happen very quickly actually so please do feel free to um all the the entire report and the graphics and the presentation that i showed you is available on the microsite which is 1021.com forward slash gsr you can also uh keep in touch with us and keep track of our activities by subscribing to the newsletter the next upcoming um uh, or the or the significant um developments for 2021 in the next six months is the, the launch of the new renewables in cities global status report but you will find the preliminary findings online we are also developing a, a regional status report for asia and pacific which will be launched actually at um Kyrek, the logo you see on screen on the between the 23rd uh, and the 25th of october in seoul and uh, yeah we'd love to hear from you because as you know, we work with this community model. So if you have something to contribute or if you'd like to uh, be a part of the work we do, please feel free to get in touch. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. And I do hope I hear from you. Now over to Kanika. Oh, I lost the slides. One second. Great, here we go. Uh, thanks, Vibhu, for a great presentation. Um, as a reminder, participants can submit the questions through the uh, questions pane at any time. We hope to get as many questions as possible in the Q&A session after this next presentation. Um, so now I'd like to welcome, make a more welcome to Kanika Chawa, who is the Director of the Centre for Energy Finance at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. Uh, Kanika, welcome. Thank you very much, Matt. And uh, also, I'd like to congratulate REN21 on an outstanding global status report for 14th year in a row, if, if I got that right. Um, I think that there's a lot of really interesting findings that Vibhu just presented, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about now are really reactions to some of the things that Vibhu presented. But, but um, given that the context of a lot of my work as well as um, what I'm supposed to be speaking about today is finance. I'm going to pick up on the aggregate investment flows into the renewable energy sector in Asia, which stand at 52%. So if you add up basically China, India and Asia uh, and o o the Oceanic region, uh, that, that amounts to more than half of all of global investments in renewable energy, which sort of seems to suggest that there's a lot of activity um, in the renewable energy markets in, in this part of the world. But that being said, when, when we see, um, break that up into the sum of its parts, we realize actually that only 15% of that money um, went into countries that were, if you were to exclude China and India. But that is not an insignificant amount. I mean, if you were to think about the, the total um, investment flows, which is uh, close to $300 billion, slightly short of $300 billion, 15% of that is not an insignificant amount of capital, especially if you were to think about um, the 
the kinds of advances being made and given the, the declining prices of renewable energy. But even within that, I think that it's interesting to, to see how most of that capital went into um, power sector um, advances only, not so much into end use sectors. Um, and then also how it was sort of mostly concentrated in some countries uh, in Southeast Asia rather than, and, and not as much in say countries in Central Asia. Um, and so then to me, I would like to sort of structure what that means into three um, categories. One is around market design and what is the role that market design plays in attracting capital, but also using the capital as a proxy for uh, deployment of renewable energy and advancing the energy transition. And then how do you unlock private capital to flow into countries where the potential for renewable energy is perhaps one of the largest in the world, given that a lot of the, the countries in Asia lie between the tropics and have very high solar irradiance, but also given that geography have a lot of uh, high wind potential. Um, uh, and have a long history as well with uh, biomass as we've seen in in uh, Indonesia and other countries in Asia and then recent advances being made in hydro and geothermal so how do you attract more capital and then the third one is around interlinkages and and regulatory environment and uh, Vibhu mentioned this briefly around how do you think about the energy transition in a more integrated way rather than just in a in a way that focuses on say power sector separately and then uh, mobility separately and uh, industry separately it's, it's how do you sort of connect the dots and and have a comprehensive view and and optimize for the energy transition both in terms of the resources required um, both in dollar value as well as in in human capital but then also uh, optimize for the timeliness of that transition so what I found very interesting was um, when when uh, the slide suggested that 135 countries had uh, policy, uh, regulatory and policy targets for uh, renewable energy, most of them in the power sector, but 111 of those were um, still continue to follow the feed-in tariff regime. Now, the feed-in tariff regime, as you've seen in, in um, several parts of the world, has been highly effective because it, it provides the impetus and the, incent the fiscal incentives required to uh, drive the energy transition, but it is not the most um, economically efficient way to make that transi uh, transition from the exchequer's point of view. And this is really interesting because the, as the price of renewable energy, especially if you were to think about the price of renewables electricity is declining significantly it's it's now we're now uh, moving towards a, a world where the kind of uh, policy support required continues to be large but the kind of subsidy required is actually um, declining because the economic case for renewables um, is is much stronger in and of itself. Renewables are close to parity when compared to several other sources of capital, sorry, several other sources of energy. And there is much more um, interest in uh, optimizing for the most uh, efficient fuel from an economic point of view, as well as from an emission point of view. And when renewables become competitive in that space, there is a, a declining need for feed-in tariffs. So I think that for a lot of the countries in Asia where there are quite well-developed markets, but their power sectors are currently um, at an inflection point where they're um, expanding from, and moving sort of uh, more away from just publicly owned generation assets to more privately owned generation assets, this transition can actually be supported through a price discovery mechanism like reverse auctions which build transparency and coherence in the market um, but need not actually put a significant burden on the exchequer in the form of feed-in tariffs. The second point is around mobilizing private capital and in this space as I was saying before if more than half of the world's uh, capital into renewable energy is flowing in Asia, which is only actually 40% of the global um, energy supply, then that, that should mean that we're actually doing something right. But 
the as we've mentioned this is disproportionately um, skewed in china's favor a lot of which is actually domestic public money um, from china so how do you think about how do you mobilize private money because a lot of the other countries in asia given that they're on a development trajectory do not have uh, boundless public reserves to to pay for this energy transition and there is a need to crowd in private capital in order to do that, it's important to understand what are the risks that are plaguing the flow of this capital. And that's where a lot of the issues around market design come in, uh, how sustainable are these policies that are being deployed, but equally also what is the financial health of the, the utilities that are going to get involved, how integrated is the plan, and is there policy certainty? So especially in, in, the, in the sectors that are still emerging, whether it's sort of roof top solar, offshore wind, um, you know, new geothermal applications, but also electric mobility, end use, uh, renewables for end use purposes. These are all sectors that require a lot of policy certainty at the moment because they don't have the long history that is that um, solar and wind installations have. And therefore, uh, investments are contingent and predicated on the fact that are we providing a conducive environment for them? And is that policy certainty going to last? So if I make a long-term investment decision, will I get returns on that investment? Um, and that is, in fact, I think increasingly the role of policy is to um, is to uh, is to ease the 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 process of investment, is to uh, enable long-term and integrated decision making rather than just provide subsidies or fiscal incentives to drive this transition forward. Um, the use of public money needs to be in catalytic ways that is market making. So it needs to be in addressing some of the risks. It needs to be um, in, in designing um, the, the types of uh, market environment that's required as well as in supporting R&D and, and uh, uh, underserved markets, but not really in project financing, but in driving in private project financing. In order to do all of that, then regulation also needs to keep up with targets, policy, um, and the long term view that governments take. And often, what we see, and this is um, especially pronounced in Asia, is that we see very large uh, targets being announced and, and, and political ambition being very much in keeping with uh, less than 1.5 or the energy transition. But this does not always translate into regulation on the ground. And that is, uh, in fact, a huge challenge because the, the regulation on the ground is really what drives action in, in a market and creates robust markets. And so in order to do that, the electricity regulators, the industry regulators, um, the um, city authorities, they all need to work together. It's not enough to have a top line a target. There is a need to break that down into the sum of its parts. And so that would require much greater action and coordination between different ministries, between different public entities, as well as between public entities and private entities, whether they are industry or um, investors. And so to my mind, the three communities or the three stakeholders that are going to drive the energy transition forward um, are governments across sort of uh, international, uh, national and subnational, but then also industry um, and then investors. And how do you bridge the gap between the three of them and build coherence? And I think that a lot of the work that's been done in the Global Status Report does um, take us some distance in, in building coherence, but it also identifies all of the areas in which more work is required, where um, gaps need to be filled. And, and, and it also sort of takes stock of what works and what doesn't work. Again, um, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, so many countries are, are adopting um, fiscal measures that act as penalties, so sort of carbon prices or shadow carbon prices or cap and trade mechanisms, which really is a is a means to price the externalities. And the externalities could, you know, in the Asian context, uh, could include everything from air pollution, um, but also uh, much more to, to actual emissions and, and beyond. So um, I think that, that there is significant advances that, that um, the renewable energy sector has made predominantly 
in the electricity space, but there is much greater need for better interlinkages between that and what happens in industry, um, end use uh, consumption in industry for heating and cooling, uh, for industrial processes, as well as for um, commercial and, and residential use, as well as in um, mobility. And in order to do that, there has to be a, a sort of multiple pronged approach. One is going to be to take a strategic view on how much electrification um, of these processes are we likely to see in the coming years? Are we going to actually see a, a large move towards electrification of the mobility fleet, electrification of industrial processes, electric cooling, electric heating, um, or are we going to do a process heat um, sort of uh, fuel cell based transition, etc. And countries just need to make these strategic roadmaps. And in order to do that, that doesn't mean that they need to make that transition today, but they're never going to be able to make it effectively if they don't plan for it um, in an integrated and strategic way starting now. So I think that the GSR is a really good call for action and it identifies what countries need to do uh, going forward. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much, Kanika, for those those thoughts. Uh, um, so I'd just like to announce that we're shifting to the Q&A session now, um, and I'd like to remind our attendees to please submit those questions through the question box at any time. Um, we'll attempt to answer as many as these as possible. Uh, however, we if we don't get an opportunity to do so, um, we'll we'll talk to you outside of this webinar. Um, so I've just got one question here, particularly that feeds directly into your uh, your points there, Kanika. But I'll, I'll let Vibhu answer this first. Um, uh, what policies, and, and this is with an Asia focus in in, in mind, um, what policies can be utilised to best address the integration of power, heating, and cooling, and transport? Um, is there one or two key overarching or holistic policies or will a, a, a policy mix be required um, and if so what would this look like so, yeah okay i can take a I, I can start and then kanika please feel you know please feel free to jump in as well from your experience i think one of the um you know one good example of of um of a kind of region trying to do this now is the European Union with the decarbonization strategy for 2030. And I think when we talk about a set of policies, we have to keep the goal of decarbonization in mind. And that's where sectoral integration between uh, the end use sectors, but also um, integration between um, what's vertical, or vertical policy integration between regional, global, national, subnational cities is required. Um, so I think there are, uh, I think when we talk about policies, I mean, that's what also Costa Rica and Denmark are talking about. It's really decarbonization of the energy system. And that is what the basis of, or that's how policies need to be um, thought of as, as one energy system rather than electricity or, or something for renewable heating or for cooling or for transport or agriculture. It's really decarbonization, which is the goal. That's from my opinion. Kanika, do you have anything in addition? Yeah, no, I think that I, I completely um, agree with your, and then the EU is a very good example, but I think that um, the answer is also partially in the question that you need a suite of options and also what works in, in one part of the world or in, in, in one region is unlikely to be exactly replicable in another region. And that's just because we have very, very, the energy transition in different parts of the world is going to look different from each other. There's, there is no one solution fits all. So I think that it's important to take the spirit of this combined action and this uh, multi-pronged approach and, and a suite of solutions kind of uh, approach that the EU is following, but then tailoring that to the very specific requirements of our countries. And that's a function as well of, um, <clears throat> economic growth, domestic driving prior, domestic drivers and priorities, um, but all of like resource availability and, and the very specific um, institutional design, right? So 
um, for instance, the institutional design in a country like India is significantly different from in what is in China, which are both very different from what is likely to be, um, you know, a possible solution for um, Laos or Cambodia. And so I think that we need to take the, the approach of, uh, of, of several different, uh, of coordination basically between between different uh, departments and between different sectors, um, but really then uh, make bespoke solutions for our countries and our regions. Great, Kanika. Any any uh, second thoughts on that, Vibhu, or any comments on that? Quick on those points that Kanika made. No, I completely agree, and I think you know that's one of the. I completely agree with Kanika. So I think that you know both of those points that we look at examples that exist for inspiration, but really tailor them down to what's relevant or what's uh, what's the regional situation is important. And having said that, I think for you know it, the, the key is really to um, kind of coordinate or, uh, or integrate these policies across the vertical line, which is, you know, uh, in the governance system. So you have regional, global, national, subnational cities, and also across Indian sectors. Those are the two characteristics that we need. Yeah, great. Thank you for, thank you both for that and that question. Um, and similarly, um, but acknowledging the fact that governments and organizations have a, sometimes have resource constraints um, so if, if, if in this environment um, and with a regional focus in Asia um, what should countries prioritize over the next say five years or so or, or immediate sort of um, timeline for their policies should they focus on uh, renewables or should it be a much more integrated approach that they need to, to focus on mm, maybe I can sorry yeah go ahead no go ahead go ahead Sorry, um, I was going to say that I think that for the countries of Asia, it, it the economics are so compelling, especially of uh, more proven and, and lower capital intensive technologies like solar and wind, that that it is really unavoidable, especially in the power sector for these countries to, to transition towards these technologies. Um, and given uh, the growing demand in a lot of the Asian economies, there is the space to follow one of these, um, we will do it all kind of approaches where we will do renewables, where we will continue to sort of operate whatever uh, thermal assets that, that we have, and then plan a phase down. So you don't actually at the moment need to plan for the transition between thermal and, and renewable energy because of the growing demand and, and um, you know, recent electrification growth in the region in Asia also uh, taps into this uh, latent demand. As Vibhu slides pointed out, there's also a growth in aspiration where you can see even in rural areas, a move from pico solar to, to larger uh, home systems, et cetera. So the, the demand um, is likely to continue growing and that makes Asia significantly different from other parts of the world where we are seeing a plateauing uh, of energy demand. So in that context, I think that um, it would be unwise to, to delay this uh, adoption of renewable energy any longer, um, despite limited resources given the, the uh, huge decline and competitiveness of renewable decline in prices and competitiveness of renewable energy, the, the time is right. And, and um, the you know, the energy transition is really here and now for all of our countries, whether they're developing or whether they are, um, you know, slightly further ahead on that uh, development curve or whether they are more developed. But it's really a function of how efficiently we, we make this transition. And again, you know, how do you uh, make it timely and how do you make it one that, that you don't really use stop cap solutions, but really sort of uh, leapfrog to to end solutions like a cleaner energy mix, which is predominantly renewable energy based. So I would say that if you have limited air resources, use that to figure out uh, grid integration challenges, uh, use that to figure out um, transmission upgrades so that you can integrate more renewables into the grid and, and use that to figure out um, the, an integrated resource plan that looks um, you know, forward, not just to 2030, but really to the middle of the century so that you can um, have a strategic plan to get there. Yeah, I think we just lost you there, Kanika, but uh, just passing on to Vibhu, any, any extra comments mm -hmm. on that question on those points? Yes, and uh, I think, I mean, Everything that Kanika said is very relevant for the region. 
particularly in, term, in terms of priorities as well, like she spoke about grid integration, et cetera. I think one of uh, one of the key characteristics of Asia that I've you know I've been noticing through this exercise for the Asia report is that um, one of the biggest challenges is actually in terms of energy security and sovereignty. Uh, there are parts of Asia where a lot of uh, a lot of the current energy supply is is actually imported, and um, and I think you know, in terms of the drivers that. That's one of the key drivers that countries could look to to increase the security of their energy supply, but also the sovereignty, because this, this is actually an interesting term I heard yesterday, uh, since uh, I met conference in Asia about how countries need to consider sovereignty as a priority, and that could be a key driver to facilitate the grid um, uh, integration and other uh, priorities. And, considering resource allocation and when you're considering the energy transition. I think this is one part, but apart from this, and, and you know, the thing we've been doing a lot at Ben21 is really considering that a mindset shift is required and we need to start thinking of an energy system as a whole. Um, and I mean, I've mentioned it several times, Kanika has mentioned it several times, but I think for me, that is the biggest takeaway for even countries like a countries in Asia, where the situation is very different from the rest of the world in terms of, demand, in terms of, in terms of um, the way the economy is growing. But I think mindset shift when we talk about energy, we understand that energy underpins, underpins everything we do is important. Yeah, fantastic thoughts there, Vibhu and Kanika. Um, thank you for thank you both for for that. Um, we might just conclude the Q and A session there. Uh, so thank you both again for that. Um, on behalf of the the Clean Energy Solutions Centre, I'd like to extend a hearty thank you to both Vibhu and Kanika for their presentations, and to our attendee, attendees for participating in today's webinar. We very much appreciate your time and hope in return we provided some valuable insights that you can take back to your ministries, departments or organisations. Uh, we also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solution Centre resources and services, including our free Ask an Expert service. I invite you to check the Solution Centre website if you would like to view today's slides and listen to a recording of the presentation, as well as review previously held webinars. Additionally, you will find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. We also post webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Centre YouTube channel. Uh, please allow about a week or so for the audio recording to be posted. Uh, finally, I'd like to take a moment to uh, I invite you to take a, a moment to complete a short feedback survey that will appear when we end the webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Centre events. Uh, this concludes our webinar for today. Thank you very much.